Welcome to Drinking Bros Sports, brought to you by KillCliffCBD.com. That's it, D'Anthony. That's it. It's over. Last dance. Last dance. My God, man, that was that was the greatest. Man, would you say the, the greatest documentary series you've ever seen? It's definitely the best sports documentary series I've ever seen. Um, Oof, that OJ one was good, though, mm, dude. The biopic from uh, Bear Bryant's time at Texas Tech or whatever the fuck it was was mm-hmm. really good, but that's not really a doc. Um, the I, OJ one was good, but this one is like, I guess this one just reaffirms uh, to everyone that Jordan is the best player that's ever existed and that Phil Jackson is the best coach. I'm like, I don't know how anybody could debate that. No, I, I don't either. Um, and the LeBron thing, I'm, I'm so fucking tired of hearing that. I, ca- I can't hear the LeBron thing anymore. Um, I, even, I even brought some shoes in today. Um, even watching that doc, <coughs> beep these. Beep these out here, dude. Boom. I mean, these... Come on, back in the day where the jam, I could, you know, funny story about this. I couldn't uh, afford these ones. Like these mm-hmm. were, th- this is when they priced us out, you know, as a kid. And it was just like, uh, this is fucked up. So as an adult, I bought these. And I was looking online at all the, the old shoes because every episode I was like, oh, fuck, I want those shoes. I want those shoes. Mm-hmm. I used to have those shoes or I didn't have those shoes. And <laughs> I wanted those badly. Um, so I, I bought these as an adult. <laughs> well, somebody just, uh, I think yesterday, bought one of his OG 1985 pairs signed for $560,000. Game use. Yeah. So it was game worn and uh, yeah, $560,000. Uh, everything about this doc was amazing to me. I, I guess it was, you know, he was a big part of everyone's childhood. And I hadn't seen or thought about him in a long time, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, he's been out of the... I, I, I don't really follow the Hornets, but I don't think he takes an active role like he did, what, like he tried to do. I mean, it's a different role. He was president of basketball operations with the Wizards, but there's a there were some interviews done uh, during... Whenever baseball came out with that, the best 100 players of all time or whatever the fuck it was, mm-hmm. and obviously Ted Williams is on that list, and people were talking about how like smart of a human... like as a hitter, like how great he was at that, and just at hitting a baseball, he's so good at it, that when he tried to become a batting coach, it, the information was lost on a lot of people. Like they couldn't, he was just like, just hit the fucking ball, man, what are you right. doing? Um, I think he expected that to happen. And I think with Jordan, like drafting Kwame Brown, he's like, hey, here's a guy that's got all the tools. This yeah. guy, all he needs is the drive. I could do that. No, you can't. Can't give somebody drive. And just he ruined work. Kwame Brown's life. <laughs> Well, I mean, he ruined a lot of players' lives over the years, probably. Like, anybody that was on the team when he showed up, like, are probably looking back now. Any of those guys, especially the ones that fell off in the 80s, in the late 80s, that just didn't fit with what he wanted for the team, are probably like, man, I could have just changed my attitude a little bit and won three championships at least. Yeah. Uh, And that's why I don't believe, like, there are some people that came out of this thinking that Jordan's an asshole. I don't, there's no way. I agree. I agree. And it, look, it was just Jordan, and that's what it takes to be the best, um, at least in my opinion. Well, he's got a good quote. And he said, because they haven't won anything. Yeah. And, and that's it's true. People that don't like the way I did things, that's because they haven't won. And, and shit. most of the articles I've read about him being an asshole are, are by people who have never won anything. And you don't know what it takes to be number one at something yeah. um, in the world. And well, it, all the people who are major players and all the championships he won were in the documentary and while they had you know some historically some things that in historical context might make it seem like they're calling him an asshole they all seemed very grateful to him and what he did for that team because a lot of people addressed it steve kerr addressed it pippen addressed it oh yeah like i needed kerr i needed jordan pippen said he needed jordan to be an asshole mm-hmm. not just for him but because he's not that guy and you need one on the team um and we'll get into it with brinkus here but uh, Jordan being such a dick to Kerr might be the reason Steve Kerr exists is like a, the cold-blooded fucking assassin that he's known for both in playing and coaching. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we got uh, ESPN sports science John Brinkus back with us again today. One of the best in the biz. Uh, he's played golf with Jordan. He worked at the Wizards for two years when Jordan was there. Um, he knows Jordan fairly well, and it was cool to get his insights on mm-hmm. watching this doc as well. We wanted to do a recap show of it for the sports show this week because that's what everybody's been watching for the last five weeks. I know, me for one, I'm grateful 
that ESPN decided to push this up and air this during this time. Yeah, I'm not too. I, I mean, I'm I'm very curious about the one that's coming down now, but it's going to be. I feel like it was weird timing. I feel like they should have played the Donald Sterling one first and then played this after, unless they have something teed up afterward because it's going to take. Right now, everybody's image is of an NBA that we want back. Mm -hmm. We need this back because we need to fucking see this shit. And I think when they play that Donald Sterling shit and how that all went down, it's going to be like, fuck, man. Like, there, a lot of people are going to lose respect for the way that the NBA is run. I think they flip-flopped the order. So looking at it last night when it was over, <laughs> uh, the, the, the three that they were cock-teasing out the most was Lance Armstrong, mm -hmm. uh, Bruce Lee, and then McGuire versus Sosa. And... The last one, when uh, Sammy Sosa went to sit down in the chair to give his interviews, and he was a white man, mm. um, was like, holy shit, this one's going to be mind-altering. And I'm excited to see it. Uh, before we hop into the interview with John Brinkus, we got some sponsors who pay for this whole shit wagon to be on the air. First and foremost, talking about ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros. Still, everything is 25% off at Ghostbed, D'Anthony. Uh, sheets. Pillows, adjustable bases, covers, all of it. Everything is 25% off. And they still have the 36-month pay-as-you-go program that is still applicable with these deals, son. So if you're going to buy a mattress, now's the time to do it. I think, I think they said they're going to go through the quarantine with it. Um, but to mind the best of my knowledge, most of it's going to end around May 30th for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So... Probably looking at another 12 days. Uh, to be fair about it, man, I, go sped for them giving fucking 25% off <laughs> for this entire time like this. Typically, this is like a Christmas type of deal, man. Mm. And uh, they ended up doing it for two months. I didn't think this shit was going to go on that long, to be honest with you. Uh, but go to ghostbed.com forward slash drinking bros today. Um, next up is our, look, this is our, our chief sponsor, dude, for the sports show. Mm -hmm. Killcliffcbd.com. Uh, the best in the biz. You're drinking Kill Cliff right now, aren't you? Yeah, I'm just hydrating though. This is uh, Endure. It's a post workout. Nice. Did you work out today? No. Huh. <laughs> I woke up and walked to my car. <laughs> Need a little post workout yeah. for you. Uh, Kill Cliff CBD has got the best in the biz. Uh, as far as CBD goes, that, that's it. They've got the best. They've got the best cans of CBD, <laughs> best drinkables on the planet. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody's drinking this shit now. People that actually have the means uh, to research this stuff and know what good products are. People like us, Joe Rogan, are all drinking it. Yeah. Because it's the best. I mean, look, I, I don't even want to imagine how many goddamn CBD companies have approached Joe Rogan because I know how many have approached me. And I'm just like, fuck, man. How many, how many can there possibly be? But the vast majority of them are fucking garbage. Yeah, man. And you this, don't know where their shit's coming from or any of that. Also, man, look, 80% of the audience is military and first responder that listen to the show, and it's just uh, you can't piss hot on drug tests, man. No, you you got to know where this shit is coming from. There is no THC in this uh, whatsoever. So it's 25 milligrams of CBD in every can. It's pure. It's Kill Cliff. So it's a brand you can trust. They got three amazing flavors, mango, orange, kush, uh, and then the grape. Grape's my jam, dude. So right now, you can use the promo code Drinking Bros for 20% off all the cans at uh, KillCliff.com and KillCliffCBD.com. It's good for both, both sites. So if you want the uh, indoor like D'Anthony's drinking or you want the CBD, you can use Drinking Bros. Promo code gets you 20% off and free shipping. Whenever you're shipping canned goods or bottles, that is a big deal. Uh, the free shipping. So go there now and enjoy the savings on us at KillCliffCBD.com. Promo code Drinking Bros, 20% off. I retract my statement about Black Ball, the documentary, because it's on Quibi, which means no one's going to see it. No, 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 no one's going to see it. Uh, Quibi might not even be a thing for, mm -hmm. I read an article this morning, they might be uh, yeah. going bankrupt pretty soon. I didn't know that. I didn't know that doc was on uh, yep. Quibi. Quibi is a paywall, by the way. It is, and it's uh, ten. You're, it's only ten minute pieces, right? Uh, I don't even know. Yeah, they're chopping it up into ten minute segments. Uh, Punked is on there, a re revamped version of Punked, but it's like Chance the Rapper. Uh, Chrissy Teigen's got a show. It's uh, that that thing's a mess. Qu any, Quibi's a mess. Why? Why does? I mean, shit. Why does anybody have a show? I guess. But. Yeah. 
Uh, why do we have a show? You know? Uh, last but not least here, we got boxofawesome.com. Box of Awesome is like getting Christmas sent to your house once a month, every single month. Uh, it's the best. You go on there, you take a little five question quiz. It determines the man or woe man you are. And then you just get the dopest shit on the planet sent to your house. No better time to get something like that than this, D'Anthony. Uh, we've gotten, God, over the, the last year, we've gotten uh, travel bags, dop kits, hatchets, whiskey <laughs> decanters, uh, you name it. They, and they tailor it to you and who mm. you are or who they think you are. And that's part of the fun of it, too, where it's just like, all right, cool. What, what's showing up this month? And who do they think I am? Yeah, there's stuff you can buy individually, too. Yeah, but they, they've got me pegged. I like the surprise boxes. I do. I just get this fucking surprise box. It just shows up once a month. Go to boxofawesome.com. Use the promo code DRINKINGBROS. That'll get you 20% off the first box. I've got a subscription, so it just shows up once a month. I figure, why not? My wife has got her bullshit uh, with the makeup and everything. I need this in my life. Uh, so go to boxofawesome.com. Peruse their site, by the way. Some of the dopest shit on the planet. Promo code Drinking Bros, 20% off. Let's hop into the show, Giorgio, shall we? Yes. Welcome to Drinking Bros Sports Companion Show. We've got ba baby Brinkus with us today. We got if you're watching hey everybody. <laughs> if you're watching the show on YouTube, he's doing his little tiny baby on Zoom. That's the that's the fun thing about the quarantine. Yeah. I mean, you know, a lot of people were complaining about the quarantine. Honestly, I, you know, found uh, certain topicals that just made my skin really smooth. <laughs> this is amazing. And I'm going to, by the way, I'm going to commit to this bit the entire show. Uh, I'm, I'm good with it. The whole show. The weird thing is it really doesn't look too much different than you right now. Um, but just you as a, maybe a 12 or 13 year old. It, it's fine. You know, it's totally fine. It's, you know, it, look, it beats Botox. And I can give you guys, I got the, uh, I'll leave the description for the uh, topicals in the notes. Sure. Mm. Please do. Please do. Uh, uh, look, kids, uh, we're in depression today, the three of us. Um, the last dance ended uh, last night. I do not know what to do with my life anymore. How great was that? I, oh, it was the greatest, you know. It, it was such a fair, real, um, honest tribute. And it, they didn't sugarcoat anything. No. And I, 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 that's what made it so endearing. It wasn't a fluff piece. It wasn't like, oh, Jordan is an infallible human being. It was Jordan's an amazing basketball mm -hmm. player who was, you know, he was hard on people. There were ups and downs. There was total chaos. Um, you know, and it's just I, the, the part to me that I loved the most was Phil Jackson's ability to just simply rise above and believe and empower people. You know, when Rodman goes off to, to Vegas and you're like, oh, my God, imagine if that happened today. I, when Phil sits back and just says, OK, what are my options here to suspend him and to teach him a lesson or to just believe in him and say, just as long as you get a bunch of rebounds, I'm cool with it. And as long as you're not doing something illegal, I'm cool with it. And uh, I, I found that to be incredibly refreshing. Yeah. And the, the other part was I forgot about the wrestling when he just in the middle yeah. of the, 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 the finale, the fucking end all be all the last dance itself between game three and four, he decides to go wrestle with Hulk Hogan. I didn't know he didn't tell the yeah. team. I didn't understand any of that until I watched it. And I was like, Jesus Christ. Could you imagine if that happened in today's game? There's no way with social media. That would have, that would have been the biggest story on the planet. Yeah. And, that, and I think that it also really demonstrates how silly the media is right now that look, he went it like, here's the point. You know, I, I obviously I was, what was I? I was uh, 27. Mm -hmm. So I was 27 when that was happening. I don't really remember that happening because he, they ended up winning the championship. Yeah. They didn't, it had zero effect. So it, it wasn't a big deal at all. And, you know, like kind of whatever. It was Rodman. And you just kind of chalked it up to it. And, you know, as long as you're not out doing something illegal and stupid and, you know, counterproductive, you know, it's just a, it was just another Rodman story. Well, I saw when Phil got asked about it, 
he was like, is this a distraction? And he's like, well, for you guys, not for us. We don't give a shit. Like, but he, but he, totally. was, he was pissed, though, behind the scenes of when course. they were showing his footage. Oh, yeah, he was pissed, yeah. But he's, I mean, he's was, a he's an animated guy when he needs to be, and he's not when he needs to be. Like, he he's one of those guys that can be very angry without ever letting it, like, there would be no physical side effects of his anger. It would just be words and shit. Yeah. Like, he's, he's com- it, I feel like he's completely in control, and Jordan had that same quality, I feel like, a lot of the time. If you guys remember the full breadth of uh, The Last Dance, you know, I think it was episode one when he goes to Chicago and guys are doing drugs and Mm -hmm. they're doing stuff that they really shouldn't be doing. And Jordan was just like, it's not me. I'm like, I'm not I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I'm I'm going to focus on basketball. And then you sort of see that all of those guys got weeded out. Jordan obviously ascends the throne and then he's constantly building a team you know, for lack of a better word, in his own image, somebody who can, who he believes he can play with. And when you say, well, is Dennis Rodman somebody he can play with? I mean, Jordan cared about two things. He cared that you were authentic Mm -hmm. and that part of your authenticity was giving 100%. And that's what Rodman did. And that was, that was the beauty. the, the, The two things is that Rodman had one speed. I mean, just like Jordan had one speed. But that quote about Jordan being present You know, Mm -hmm. it was so powerful of that was his gift being in the moment that that really was his gift. That that was very powerful to me. What was it? His trainer that said that? I think or maybe Uh, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Was was it his trainer or agent? Yeah. Yeah. No, it wasn't his agent. It wasn't agent. I'm only looking at because I had a bunch of people texting me that today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Let me ask you about this. There's two schools to this. To like like camps that people are in on or, or schools of thought if you if you want to, um, a lot of people say Jordan came off like an asshole in this. A lot of people said this is what the greatest of all time would look like and how how one would act if you were in this world. What what is your thought on that? Which which school of thought are you in? Because like I watched I it with came, I watched it with I my think, wife. So I think it came down to being real. You know, that Jordan and, and, and it was in, I think they were, they, I think it was episode seven when he broke down, when Jordan broke down crying, talking about, you know, winning has winning, you know, has a price. Mm. And I feel like, I, I feel like all of us can be Jordan-esque in this way. When you make a commitment to something, you can stick to it. And Jordan made it a commitment to winning and you never, and certainly in that era and not for Michael Jordan, the, the the phrase load management didn't exist. Yeah. yeah. Hey, he, he wasn't like, I'm taking a game off. And not only did he not take a game off, he didn't take a half off. Mm. He was like, if they were getting their ass kicked, he was like, whatever, I'm going to still play through. Mm. You know, I'm not going to ask to be taken out. Like, I'm, you know, I, I owe it to the world to give my best. And that had a huge price. And you could tell how emotional it was to Jordan because – he never wavered in that, you know, right or wrong, whether or not he should have been nicer or should have been, um, you know, it, it, it didn't matter. It, it like the, the end result was what he wanted and he wasn't doing anything. Like I keep saying, he wasn't doing anything illegal. He wasn't doing, doing things that were inherently evil. He was, he was, he obviously had his own leadership style and, you know, I've been ridiculously blessed, ridiculously blessed to, to know Jordan a bit. We belong to the same country club. He's a sports science fan. We play golf together. He's a, and I've gotten to know him a bit. And he came up to me and was like, oh my God, I'm a big sports science fan. And I said, who are you? I was like, what is that? <laughs> um, so the, uh, anyway, he, he's super competitive about everything. You know, when you play him in golf, it, it, it was funny. I played him in, in uh, first time we were playing golf. He's like, how much are you putting up? And I said, listen, there are a lot of guys who are going to like, throw down a hundred grand or 200 grand just to play golf with you. I said, you're a cool dude. Love to play golf, but I'm just not that guy. I don't gamble. So, you know, I'm not going to throw down a hundred grand on you or even 10 grand. You know, I'm not going to throw down a crazy amount of money because I just want to play. And he's like, you got to put something down. <laughs> so, so I'm like, how, mu- how much? <laughs> and so he determined, you know, some amount that was acceptable. I'm like, all right. He's like, I, I can't play unless I know I can I can take something from you. That's it was great. like that was just his mentality. It's it's pretty funny. Who won between you guys? 
Well, I will have you know that I'm very proud to say that we pushed twice. And now, mind you, he did give me nine strokes, okay. but it's a push nonetheless. <laughs> Look, a push is a push, you know? You got to take push it. Push is a push? You got to take it. Yeah. Um, so when I watched it, because I watched it with my wife, I, I'm, I thought to myself, I was like, look, to be the greatest of all time, you have to be an asshole. Um, you have to isolate yourself. Like, I, I don't think there's any way to go through it and be that famous and lead a team to victory without being an asshole. She, on the other hand, was just like, man, I, she loved the doc. You know, she was like, this should win all the awards, which I agree as well. Um, but she said... <laughs> I, I thought he was an asshole at the end of it. And I heard, uh, you know, through, I think it was ESPN or, or one of those Fox morning shows that Jordan was a little worried about how he came off in this because he's been so protective of his image for, you know, 40 years, essentially, um, that he was worried that, you know, the, the squeaky clean Jordan image uh, that people had in their mind was going to be shattered after this, which uh, he's exactly who he thought he was, but I didn't know any of this shit was going on behind the scenes, truthfully. You, you know, the uh, during that Bulls era, I mean, I think you heard at the end when they were saying, yeah, I would have come back for one more, mm -hmm. you know, had it not been for Jerry Krause saying you can go 82 and 0 and you're still not coming back to Phil Jackson. Um, that that's some that's some that's craziness, right? Mm -hmm. It's crazy that we all were kind of denied, you know, at least seeing another championship run. Um, and you know, I was listening to Michael Wilbon last night in the, the post show mm -hmm. and Wilbon actually, it, so Wilbon was the, uh, Washington DC, one of the Washington DC, um, Washington post sports reporters. Um, and this was before PTI and my company had the, um, exclusive contract for the Washington bullets, um, slash wizards. And so we were together all the time. And what, what you saw in Jordan when every time that he played was, you, you kind of have to lose to get him off the court. And while some people say he went out on his own terms with the Bulls, and when asked the question, well, would you have come back to play again, even if you weren't going to win a championship? And he said, yeah, we totally would. Those who are saying, I know he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have come back because he wouldn't be, he's not willing to go out there and lose. I'm like, really? He came back and played for the Wizards. Yeah. Like the guy he played for the Wizards and they never made the playoffs in two years. So he like still had a lot of fire in him for sure. He did. It's just, uh, I, I look at that 97 or, you know, that, that's uh, that 97, 98 team. I, I looked at it, you know, watching it back was, that was probably it, I think. And I think everybody walked away at the right time. Um, the one thing that they didn't bring up in there was, you know, with Jordan saying everybody could have come back on a one-year deal, and they would have, except for Pippen, possibly. Pippen had gotten screwed in that in that contract. Um, for, you know, seven years, what was it, $18 million or whatever it was. Uh, Jordan every year took the max. He took $35, $36 million. Whatever the max salary was, he took it every single year in all these one-year deals and just kept doing it over and over and over again. If he wanted Scotty to get paid, he could have helped Scotty get paid. Well... He only took 35 when he came back. Mm. Before that, he hadn't made 35 in his career. No, he was making three, so, I think. Yeah, three a year. But when he yeah, came back. he was making, dude, Jordan was making nothing. Believe me, his biggest gripe, you know, as owner now is, you know, these kids are signing contracts. He's like, literally, for more money than I made through the first 11 years of my career. Yeah. He's like, I got paid nothing. And he, so he didn't it, you pay know, the Kemba fact Walker. that he was taking money, I mean, you were getting Jordan at a bargain at a hundred million dollars, mm. right? I mean, you couldn't pay him enough. So, and the fact of like, oh yeah, he could have paid Scotty it wasn't his job to pay Scotty, and the Bulls could have paid Scotty. I mean, they there there was a luxury tax back then that they could have just simply gone over and paid it. Yeah, and the worldwide rights to Jordan playing basketball that they owned is like yeah, the the amount of money they made off that is immeasurable, to be honest. And it's probably the reason that it basketball is. exists the way it does in China right now. Like he, a lot of people give some of the uh, more current guys uh, the nod for that, but I think the ramping up of basketball in Europe and Asia is because of Michael Jordan and his. Like he rose above the sport. He was an icon. Like it, it, well, he wasn't just an athlete. He was someone that 
most people with access to any kind of technology would know who he is. Oh yeah, he's yeah global. He, he, I mean, yeah. They, here's a great a, a great little story of um, when you know, our, like I said, our company was doing all the production for the they were the Wizards when Michael Jordan ended up joining, but um, before he joined the Wizards, they were the Bullets and the Clinton Lewinsky uh, affair and scandal was in full swing. And it was the playoffs, and the Bulls were playing the Bullets out at, I think it was called the USA Arena at the time, the old Cap Center. And there was a night, the night before the Bullets came to town, I mean the Bulls came to town, Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton were at a Bullets game on the same night sitting opposite each other in the stadium. <laughs> and it was a surreal completely surreal right it's the biggest presidential scandal in the history of scandals and they're both at a basketball game and the number of media that were there international media was just like crazy we're like oh my god i mean it, somebody from every country was there and they're like oh my god this is unbelievable the president is and his mistress are sitting in the stands watching a basketball game so that was that was night nice. the next night Jordan came to town. There were triple the amount of press credentials just to watch Michael Jordan at the height of the biggest political scandal of all time. Still, the world is like, well, Jordan is three times as big a story as the biggest political scandal of all time. Yeah, I mean, that guy, man, w watching back at it, it what's, what I'm grateful for, extremely grateful for, is that it shows the world that he really was the greatest of all time. I still don't understand anyone who's willing to have a, a conversation of LeBron versus Jordan. I, I will never get it. And especially after watching this, because we're, we live in an age where the, the, the media cycles in and out 24 hours and that's it. You forget about it. Somebody's called the goat every single day or a genius. Um, in this case, Jordan was the best of all time. And LeBron is nowhere close to me. Is, is he for you? I mean, for me, look, I, I'll be honest with you. I Obviously, I was born in 71. So Jordan, you know, there's no player, uh, you know, in professional sports who had a bigger impact on me than Michael Jordan. So, of course, I'm going to say Jordan's the greatest. But I, I think that in my, you know, as I, you know, every year that I age, I sit back and I say, isn't it kind of like art? Isn't it a little bit like saying, what's the better painting? Because you cannot compare these two guys and these two eras, you know, with the, the different rules, the different players, the different, I mean, everything is different. Could LeBron have played in the era of Jordan? I mean, he certainly is bigger and stronger than Jordan. Like, could he have gotten knocked around as much? Totally. Could, could LeBron have, has, uh, is LeBron as good as Pippen? Sure. I mean, absolutely. That when we start arguing best overall ever, I mean, let, let's the, the defense for LeBron is that he won championships with more than one team, and when he left the team, they were garbage. Like the year he left, so if it was Cleveland, he left, they were terrible. Miami, he left, they were terrible. Like he had a profound effect. When Jordan left the Bulls, they still won sixty-eight games the next year. Right. And they weren't terrible. They made it to the Eastern Conference Finals. So I think there's a good argument to be made that LeBron is probably the single most valuable player, meaning you could put him on any team and they're a legit finals contender. I'm not sure that's the same for Michael Jordan. With that being said, I think that given their respective teammates and teams, Jordan was the best player ever, but he was also surrounded by amazing players and an amazing coach all the time. I've got a bit of a different take on that. I think that we make the mistake of comparing their ability to just play basketball with, with each other. Like right. the way LeBron plays basketball and the, the success of that and the way that Jordan plays basketball and the success of that. Now, there are some guys, some athletes out there that have this intense drive to win and it works out for them a lot. Like Craig Council, for example, is like that. He, he's just like on playoff team after playoff team after playoff team, no matter where he went. His team always seemed to do really well. Robert Ory is another example of that. He wasn't like, Robert Ory was not the best basketball player of all time. He's not even a top 10 player, but he's got more rings than any player, right, in the modern era. 
So uh, that there are people like that. Then there are great athletes like Vince Carter, for example, amazing athlete, loves playing basketball, plays it very well. Tracy McGrady, pe- people like that. I would say LeBron's probably in that category too, maybe, maybe a little bit elevated. But uh, Jordan had both. He had the intense desire to win no matter what, even if it's a game of cards with the fucking security guards in the locker room. Or if he's on the, on the court, and he had probably some of the best basketball skills ever. I don't think Jordan compares to LeBron as an athlete, frankly, because LeBron's body is built differently. He's a fucking linebacker that can run a 4-240. You know, like he's a massive human a being. A freakish athlete. Yeah, and he's got a soft touch. Like he's got all the stuff that you would want in a basketball player, but I think mentally... I don't know if anybody has ever even come close to what Jordan put together as a, as a whole basketball player. Maybe Kobe Bryant is probably the closest, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah, that, that, what was interesting is my son, who's 14, watching uh, The Last Dance, his first comment was, man, he moves a lot like Kobe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, it's the identical. other way around, Bryce. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's identical. Even after celebrating the championships, when he's going the five on top of the scoreboard, Kobe did the same thing in L.A. And it was uh, a a lot of the same movements, uh, the way they acted. And then at at the funeral, when Jordan was speaking about Kobe, it made sense that they were secret friends. And they used to send each other text messages about, you know, how to deal with fame, how to deal with life after basketball, all of it. I mean, he really modeled totally. himself after Michael Jordan to a T, even using the same trainer. Totally. Like, and here's what's crazy. If you want to do a, like, what are the chances? Uh, sort of, uh, I loved playing this game. Like, what are the odds that you're a kid growing up in Italy and you're watching Michael Jordan via VHS tapes and you're idolizing the single greatest basketball player of all time? And in the back of your mind, you have the audacity to say, I think I could probably be as good as him someday. So you start to imitate his moves and you got that swag and you got like the tongue and, you know, you're a pretty good athlete and you get drafted in the NBA when you're 17, 18 years old. You wind up being on a Laker team that ends up having Phil Jackson, the same coach as the, as the guy you're <laughs> worshiping. And you end up winning five championships and everybody is legitimately arguing, is Kobe as good as as Michael? What are the odds that that could happen? Like he's one of one. Yeah. Like there's no one else in the world who said, I want to be just like Michael Jordan and was coached by the same coach, won championships, looked like them, acted like them. Like he's one of one. Yeah. And to me, I look, I always put Jordan at one, Kobe at two, and I've got LeBron at three. Um, I just, I, LeBron's game and his, that the, the mental part of that game for, for me, I just, I can't stand it. I can't stand LeBron. I can't stand, I can't stand the, the comparisons, all of it. I don't care about any of that, but I, I think the style is a, an important issue. Like the bully ball stuff that he's able to do that most people aren't that to me, it's, it's a lot like Bill Russell playing when he played, he was the only guy out there that was that tall. And he was definitely the only guy out there that tall that had any fucking skills whatsoever. Keep in mind, he only shot like 50% from the free throw line. So he wasn't that great at everything. And he, he also only scored, I think, for his career. It was like 20, 22 points a game maybe in that era. I know yeah. it wasn't a scoring league or anything like that, but I don't get – like Bill Russell's teams were dominant for sure, and he personally was dominant, 25 rebounds a game for his whole career. Um, I got it. But he was also so physically different than everybody else. And I think that's what you're seeing now with LeBron. You're, we're talking about some guy imitating what Jordan – did and i'm sure all the the confluence of all those things the coach and uh having the right body for it and the right mentality the right upbringing whatever you want to say to that and then being exposed to jordan that all matters but i don't think there's anybody coming that's going to replace lebron in the way that he plays i don't see it like who's got a body like that, I, that can yeah move like i don't that? know you know that i i feel like in my argument and we've done this before of like who's truly irreplaceable lebron always leads my list mm. of you cannot <laughs> You, you can n- never convince me that LeBron is replaceable. He's like the only one of the only players in the NBA today where y- you put him on any team yeah. and they're a championship contender. You mm-hmm. take them off and they suck. So, you know, he's the definition of irreplaceable. I think so. I, I just don't think they're, I mean, like Jordan was a category of one. Uh, no one's done. He's not, 
LeBron's not as likable. No, he's I not. I mean, that's, he's, he's, he's just not as likable. You know, he made a bad move down in Miami in a really poor way. Yeah. He's not as flashy. He's not as – I mean, Jordan – when Jordan walks, you like – as a dude, you stand back and you go, man, I wish I could walk like that. Yeah. Like, God, he's got swagger. Every time you <laughs> see him, like in, w- with a suit on, walking out of those pressers last night, it was like, I get two inches. It just went up two right there. Um, yeah. Because he's just a, he's a good looking dude. I felt the same way about Kobe too. Good looking dude, dressed yeah. well. The way, way they carried themselves, the way they moved on the court, it was just classy, man. It's it, elegant is is the way they they looked. It and was, played. and if you think about Jordan's sound bites that you that you saw and you heard in in um, in the Last Dance, you know his press conferences were not boring, cookie cutter, you know whatever. You were listening to, you know, when he was like, we're going to win game seven. Mm. Like, guys don't do that anymore. You know, very rarely. Yeah. You know, if they do it, they're usually wrong. Yeah, yeah. honestly, I think he's that's... He's just like, we're going to win. I think that's one of the it. things that rubs me the wrong way about LeBron. I feel like he's kind of a pussy, to be honest. Like, just the way he carries himself. And maybe that's emblematic of the, this generation and how the kids act these days or whatever. But when he, try, yeah. when he tries to act hard and tough, it's very, uh, like, it's not real. You can tell that it's being forced. It's disingenuous and I'm not it's just like his whole personality is fake I think Jordan was like I'm gonna take the best things about me and make that my brand and that's what he did but LeBron's like I need a brand here's what my brand should be and I'm gonna act like that in public that's I agree like I don't I don't yeah. like that shit yeah yeah the only the only thing I would say is you know LeBron the the reason why I respect LeBron so much is obviously I think he's incredibly irreplaceable but also you have not read anything about any kind of off-court issues. I mean, there's nothing that's like, yeah, but, you know, he Mm. has 12 wives. Right. You know, yeah, but, you know, there's some, he's involved in some crazy money laundering scheme. Like, he's got nothing on him. And he's a clean dude. He's done a lot for the community. You know, he's a very, from what I can tell, and I've only had the chance to meet him a few times, um, from what you can tell, it while it may be if even if it's calculated, even if like a cynics were like, ah, it's calculated, it's a you know, carefully manufactured persona, even if that's true, it hasn't fallen apart. Mm. So, and that's more than you can say for someone like Tiger Woods, who had this carefully constructed persona and then it all fell apart. Yeah. So I think that that LeBron, we do have to celebrate LeBron for at least Staying clean. I mean, and the, <laughs> having the persona hold up. Well, you can't question his work ethic either. I mean, he's done. He's made some stupid oh. decisions, like moving, going to Miami, and doing it like that, and fucking over the Cleveland fans. And that's what he did. I mean, look, there's. It's one thing to be like to be graceful and magnanimous and say, you know what, guys, I'm going to go down here and try this out, but I love you and blah blah blah. It's not. I, I'm going to take my talents to South Beach. That's what a fucking piece of shit says, to be honest. And uh, I, I'm not a Cleveland fan. I don't give two fucks about that, but that is how a piece of shit acts in life. But he was young, you know, stupid. Was he 26, 25, 26? He was young, dumb. But then he went back eh. to Cleveland and then left them again. Yeah. Um, eh, I really don't want to play for my home city again, so I'm going to leave and go to Los Angeles. Um, so nobody, and nobody, nobody could blame him. I mean, he's kind of like, I did what I said I was going to do. Mm-hmm. Came back, got you guys your only championship against all and I'm odds. Out of here. I mean, he had to bait Draymond Green yeah. to punch him in the nuts to win. So, because yeah. otherwise, I they mean, lose he had, that he, had the, he had the chase down, right? That's just oh, like his iconic. Ig- yeah, but Iguodala, moment. Iguodala looked like uh, Scotty Pippen did in Game Six of the fucking Jazz uh, Finals. Like he, his back was yeah. all fucked up. I'm, I'm surprised uh, he even took that shot. To be honest, such a skill. Like I know. A, I, I thought he would. Pop it out to, to Steph, who was, uh, I think, on his left on the baseline or heading towards the baseline or some shit. But when it, whenever, yeah, it was on his left, whenever he yeah. went up for that layup, it, I was like, there's no fucking way. LeBron's going to crush the backboard with this fucking thing. What are you doing? Before he even started, like, as soon as I saw his eyes go towards the rim, I'm like, fuck. Because I'm a Warriors fan. I've lived in Oakland for years. I'm so I mean, fucking I mean, you pissed. saw how, yeah, Iguodala kind of. You know, get, he he definitely wasn't hearing the footsteps. No, not at all. And it <laughs> like wasn't. There was two guys around. Dramatically underestimated. Wasn't who was the other guy that was right next to him? There was there were two guys right there. LeBron jumped over a guy to basically to fucking swat that ball. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't remember. I, I all I remember is watching it. And I was actually in I was actually in Vail at a lacrosse tournament with my son, and the lobby was packed watching the game. 
and that chase down block happened. And I mean, just everyone's just, Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> it was just unbelievable. That and that, uh, that, uh, Kyrie Irving shot from the wing are the two biggest plays oh, of that series. Yeah. Obviously. I mean, you, you mean like the 40 foot three? Yeah. 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 Pretty much. Yeah. Like he's just hucking it. <laughs> yeah. They were like, he's not a very good three point shooter. I don't think just naturally he, he, he's, He's become better over the time, over time, but uh, man, yeah. I, he threw that up and it hit the back of the fucking rim and went in. I'm like, shit, here we go. Yeah. Like, there wasn't there like a two yeah, minute it was, period, it, it, there was like it, a two minute period with no scoring at the end of that game or some shit, and then he yeah. hit that shot. Heartbreaking. I know. It's uh, crazy. A, uh, it was but, really crazy. The, yeah. This this morning though, by the way, um, they got some of the reactions from the guys who were in the dock and how they came off. Uh, one was Scotty Pippen, and uh, he had told friends. Uh, allegedly, that he was not happy how he was portrayed in the doc. How did you think Scottie Pippen was portrayed? I, I, I liked him. I thought he was cool as shit. I didn't know much about Scottie Pippen growing up, and uh, I thought he came off like a pimp to me. I, I thought he was portrayed. I did. I do not know him. I, I've never interacted with him. I don't. I mean, other than interviewing him or something. But he, uh, I thought he was portrayed really in a very positive light, you know. And I thought that, you know, by Jordan saying. I never won a championship without Scottie Pippen. I mean, that I mean, what bigger compliment can you have? Yeah. So I, I don't I don't know why. If if he's complaining because, you know, he, he look, he did decide to sit out, you know, when yeah. you know, in that uh, Eastern Conference Finals thing. Like he did or he did he did decide to sit out. He did make mistakes. And they and if you know, if they wanted to point out Jordan's mistakes, they can point out Pippen's mistakes. Um, he's not impervious to that, so I thought he was. I thought he was treated fairly, in my opinion. Same. Uh, Dennis Rodman gave a typical Dennis Rodman response of, "No, nah, I thought it was great. Um, you know, yeah. that's exactly what it was. And that's I mean, exactly what I was doing, and it was a, it was a blast. Yeah. Um, uh, he was fine with it. Luke Longley was missing from the dock. Um, do you know why? I don't. Is there a reason? I, I, allegedly, he hates Jordan. Um, and he was Ooh. never able to get over whatever they went through in practice or whatever he said to him. But uh, he, he was absent from the dock, which was surprising. All of our fans yeah. out there that are military members know there's, a, there's been a Jordan in your life at some point. It was probably a drill sergeant or drill instructor. That's just what he is. You can't take that shit personally. Like, yeah, we got to know. And it's when you show up to a new unit, too, if you're in a fucking infantry unit. We got to know that when you go out there and shit starts going down, you're going to fucking be present. And be able to handle the stress and if you can't you got to get the fuck out of here yeah so that's why he baits mm. people into fights all the time it's just what it is like you do that that's why when you go into a fucking infantry barracks room dudes are beating the shit out of each other and fucking getting in fights and doing stupid shit all the time and it's not about uh just being wild ass kids it's about pushing people to their limits like that that stuff has a yeah. place and hazing has a fucking place and we've become so soft in our culture now that i don't know if we're going to see another uh true dynasty because i don't know what player would do it like LeBron had the best chance in our generation. Kobe was in his generation. He there, that was a dynastic team, and now LeBron in this generation had the best chance to do it, and he couldn't do it. To be honest, like he should have done it before the Warriors even came about. Yeah, in Cleveland. Yeah. How how badass is Steve Kerr? Oh well, man, he's got seventy fucking championship rings. So. I did not know that exactly. his, his father was killed in Beirut. Yeah, he was a professor. That whole storyline. Um, and that was, to go to Dan's point, what he was just talking about, he, look, he, he punches Jordan in the chest, gets gets punched in the face back, and then, boom, hits the, the game winner that everybody remembers Steve Kerr from hitting that game winner. He hit a million oh. big shots in his life. Does, does Steve Kerr even become Steve Kerr if it's not for Jordan screaming at him all goddamn day? I mean, there there was a fantastic lineage of um, that Sports Illustrated did of you know everyone who ever played with Jordan and when they went off, what happened to them, and you know Kerr is like one of the only ones who went off and won, you know, one more. Yeah. Um, you know, he goes to San Antonio, wins wins a couple there, and you know he then goes to Golden State as a coach and he wins obviously he wins a ton there, and you know he's just a badass. I mean, think think about. Steve Kerr, and he's the last guy to say, I'm awesome. He's the first guy to say, I got a chance to play with Jordan, and I was able to take some pretty wide-open jump shots. And then I got to play with one of the greatest coaches in pop. And then yeah. I got to play, you know, I got to coach. You know, remember when he was being courted for coaching, it was 
between the Knicks and the Warriors. Yep. <laughs> Can you imagine <laughs> like how much like is there ever has there ever been a bigger no brainer ever? Yeah, crazy. Well, as long as Dolan is in New York, that's a no-brainer. If anybody else owned that team, right. then that would be a whole different conversation because the Knicks have money to spend. Like you can build any team you wanted to in that city, absolutely, because any player will come there and you'll have ult- uh, like an infinite amount of money to pay them. But pre-COVID, pre-COVID yeah, pre-COVID, yeah. exactly. Uh, you know pre-COVID. about about Steve Kerr's dad. Uh, he he actually was in. Uh, Beirut during the uh, Beirut bombings on the Marine bases there in 1983. That mm-hmm. was in October. Um, and that was the first act of Arab or, or, or uh, uh, Muslim on West, like bombing terrorism in history. Um, and he stayed there, right? So, I mean, I guess right. to, to, Kerr's, to, the, to the point of Kerr being a tough guy or whatever, I think he, it was probably some genetics in that too. Like he probably oh, yeah. was just that kind of guy. But I can't imagine the getting razzed by Michael Jordan and then trained to be a coach by Phil Jackson and Pop, you know, hurt, <laughs> I guess, right? Shit. I mean, that's yeah. like, you can't ask for a better education than that. So he's had every advantage, except for, you know, his dad getting murdered. <laughs> yeah, I mean, except uh, for that little thing. That. Yeah. Yeah. Which you get, I thought, I thought it was weird that, and he, I guess he made a point of it uh, to, to bring it up, but it's to, weird to me that Jordan and Kerr didn't connect about that, about both of their, especially like, because Kerr was on the team, right? When, when Jordan came back, when did he get signed? It was, it was that 95, 96 season, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 He was there for, he, he was there for, uh, he was there for all three, wasn't he? Yeah. But was he there for the comeback year where they didn't win? Like his the half season Jordan. Played. I don't think so. Yeah, so he was. Uh, no, I think he was. I think he was in. I think in the documentary he was. Well, either I way, he, I it's, think he was. It's surprising yeah. to me is like that's just twelve guys traveling around and you don't really make. There's not a whole lot else to do except for hang out with each other and talk to each other. I'm surprised that right. never came up to be honest. But he Kerr said he thinks it was still it, too fresh for Jordan and way too painful for him. Even, I mean, look, Steve Kerr's dad died in 1984, right? That's 36 years ago. Mm-hmm. And he's still just at the mention of it, can't control himself. You know what I mean? I know. So, uh, it's, you know, that bond is crazy, man. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you, if you guys have lost a parent yet, but it's, you know, it's, it's hard. It's really hard. And mm-hmm. it's not something that you like go around and say, you know what I want to talk about right now? I want to talk about losing a parent. Yeah. Most of the time it's shocking too, where it's, you know, you get a call in the middle of the night and uh, I know I yeah. got it. I got it before. And it's one of those things you're always unprepared for and you never really want to talk about it. Uh, so I, I understood that part of it. Um, let me ask you yeah. this. Did you hear any stories about Jordan behind the scenes? Because you've worked with ESPN for many, many years. And you've, I feel like you've worked with everybody, to be honest with you. Uh, Did you hear any <laughs> other crazy stories behind the scenes that were not in this in The Last Dance? So here's what's... I mean, everybody... Everybody knows that. I mean, Jordan liked to gamble. They covered that. You know, I, you know, I, the, the, he kept his circle very, very tight. And he was very smart. And you heard him say in episode eight when he was talking about Gus, um, he'd like to keep it small just because he knew, he knew those people didn't want anything from him other than <laughs> friendship and other than they weren't looking for a handout or for money. And, you know, they were older than all of his, the guys that hung around with him are, are older mm. and they were just more father figures. And he never had those punks that he hung around with, you know, like he just never, he never did that. The one story that was, that, that's very interesting that I, I, I will remind everybody of this, this is the, this is the story I tell, I, I tell this story over and over and over because it's a great lesson about life. Michael Jordan is by far the best basketball player of all time. And when he had the chance to go to the Wizards, he went to the Wizards and Ted Leonsis, who's a, who's a very dear friend, known Ted forever, he brought Jordan in through his side of, there were two companies, Washington Sports Entertainment, and it was called, at the time it was called Lincoln Holdings that became Monumental Sports. Lincoln Holdings, Ted owned essentially half the team and Abe Pullen owned the other half. And he had Susan O'Malley and Wes Unseld and their crew and Ted brought in Michael Jordan as like a 10% owner through his side. And so essentially Jordan snuck into being a, a, an owner at that point through Ted, which was, which was incredible. I mean, Ted pulled off a miracle. 
So Michael Jordan's now part of the ownership group. He's, he was president of player personnel. And everyone was saying, well, is it possible that Jordan's going to play again? And the se- overall overwhelming sentiment was no way. There's no way he's going to play again. So he sat around, watched the players, just kind of analyzed everything and concluded this team would be better off if I played for them because I will raise the value of the franchise and I will instill a work ethic and, you know, we'll have a fighting chance and it, it'll, be the, it'll be good for the franchise. So he then, you can't be an owner player in the league. He comes back and he plays for two years. They sell out. The Wizards had the, the best attendance record in the league. It was, a, it was an unbelievable traveling show. Everybody got to see Michael Jordan for one last time. He played for two years, was injured, just got injured. His body was older. You know, he obviously wasn't the same Jordan physically, but was still there uh, mentally, like to root everybody on. So he then concludes, I can't hang and I'm not, I'm going to retire for good. And when he left, he kind of made a gentleman's agreement that when he would come back, he, he then increased the value of the franchise and he would have his seat back at the table. But you can't sign anything because it would basically circumvent the rules. He ended up coming back and Ted, of course, is like, absolutely. Abe Pullen at that time was like, you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. You're not going to be part of the ownership group anymore. And it's a very famous meeting that happened. And we, we were, we, it, it was, uh, it was, it was uh, you know, written up in the post, but it was basically Curtis Polk, Michael Jordan, Ted Leonsis, Abe Pullen. And we, as the media group, just happened to be really, really sort of close to the story. And I tell everyone, look, was, was Abe Pullen right or wrong to dismiss Michael Jordan? My answer is, dude, if you think you're not replaceable, you have another thing coming because if Michael Jordan can get essentially dismissed from an NBA team, who in this world is safe? No one is. And you're always replaceable. And it was as much of a tough situation as that was. Again, with Jordan, you know, it forged a fire and said, you know, I'm coming back. And he's a, he, he is a better owner than ever. Um, and he did figure out a way to become um, you know, the majority owner in an NBA team rather than being a minority owner. Um, and it, it's a pretty shocking story that I say is something that we all, all can learn from. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, two more people uh, in this doc last night uh, said that they did not want to do it at all. Um, and it was uh, Reggie Miller and Patrick Ewing. Um, they, yep. they said, I, we did not want to do this at all. They called ad nauseum. And then finally, you know, they agreed to do it. Uh, and both of their reasons were the same, where we were in it. We had to go against Jordan every day. We didn't want to watch that footage and relive those games because we had to go up against him during it. I, you know, and none of them apparently had watched the game since. And uh, Ewing and uh, uh, Reggie Miller had to be Reggie. begged to do it. Yeah. When you look at, in terms of all-time great players, you got somebody like Reggie Miller. I mean, Reggie Miller was as competitive as anyone. Mm-hmm. Um, that thirty for thirty. What, what, what's the thirty for thirty called for? What was it? Oh, the one man. with when he scored nine points in eleven seconds. Oh, it was called like uh, seven seconds or something like that. Um, it, yeah, it was, yeah, it was eight, called. Eight it's eight amazing, points. right? He scored he, eight points in nine. He had seconds. that fire. Yeah, it's called winning yeah, time. He had that fire, and he had the ability and. You know, I, I don't blame him for saying, I don't feel like doing this. You know, like, you know, Jordan, yeah, he beat us, but he wasn't intimidated by him. And, you know, Patrick Ewing, of anybody, I grew up in the D.C. area. Um, so Patrick Ewing, to me, was such another, uh, yet again, another guy. What a class act that guy was. Mm-hmm. I mean, in college, he was just berated all the time. And he ended up winning a national. We remember when they lost the first championship. Um, uh, you know, when when Ewing got there, and uh, they ended up losing to Villanova. It was mm. a big deal, and everyone's like, "Oh, Ewing sucks, and he's terrible." And he finally wins a championship, and then he's on the dream team, gets a gold medal, and he goes to play for the Knicks, and they get close a bunch of times. But if it weren't for Jordan, Michael, you know, Patrick Ewing probably has a couple championships. They just couldn't get through the Bulls. And it's, it, that's the shame is that Ewing, when you sit back and you think of all time great centers in, in NBA history, Patrick Ewing absolutely is one of them. Everyone says, oh, he choked and he didn't win a championship, whatever. 
he had to go through the bulls. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like it, it was, it was, that was hard. So it's, it's very difficult um, for him to want to relive that. I mean, if you're going to call a team, the best team in history, it's hard to call everybody. They beat losers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you're totally. supposed, you're supposed <laughs> to lose to the bulls. That's what's supposed to happen. That's why it was such a big deal when the jazz came close and the Pacers came close. Otherwise it's not a story. It's, it's the, yeah, yeah, I get pissed when people say the Buffalo Bill, the Jim Kelly Buffalo Bills were terrible. I'm like, terrible? They're arguably, they, they absolutely need to be mentioned as one of the greatest NFL teams of all time. You know, they're a Scott Norwood field goal away from, you know, winning a, t- winning a Super Bowl. And they, they made it back over and over and over and over. That's hard to do. Yeah, it's it's next to impossible. And, you know, if you look at the two years he was off, the Houston Rockets won both of those years. Um, so Ewing, you know, yeah. Ewing finally did go to a finals, um, but he got he yeah. ran into a buzzsaw. And the, the weirdest thing about that, the only thing that I remember that NBA finals for is not for the Knicks-Houston Rockets series. It's for O.J. Simpson disrupting the game with that car chase. Yeah. When they cut away in the, in the third quarter and, and everybody was like, oh, shit. Um, yeah. That series was great too, because if you if if everybody remembers, you know Ewing and Olajuwon were playing against each other in college. Yeah, like it was huge. <laughs> so it was massive. But all I all I can remember is the car chase of OJ during that. Ewing got the short end, and then Reggie Miller. You know, poor Reggie Miller. After losing to Jordan all these years, then he ran into Kobe Bryant, who ate him up in the finals, and it was like, man, totally. Do you remember uh, the OJ? On the OJ chase, um, I only know I only know this because I saw it on a behind the music documentary that I will never forget. D- David Hasselhoff had a pay per view um, that night, and he would like it was being touted in this big thing, and he was <laughs> on top of the world with Baywatch. He was one of the you know world's biggest stars, and the OJ Simpson thing happened, and his pay per view numbers were like zero. Man, uh, well, it's like bad timing. Yeah, Hasselhoff wasn't wasn't the greatest singer of all time either. But uh, yeah, uh, but he would have made. Yeah, yeah. He OJ owes him a little bit of money. <laughs> OJ owes a lot of people money. You know the Goldman. Exactly. Uh, he, he owes a lot of people money. Um, yeah. Have you heard about the Kobe doc? By the way, so there was also a, a team that was behind Kobe's last year, shooting every last second and stitch of footage. Um, that they're going to put yeah. that together for Kobe's last year as well. I didn't hear about that until a few weeks ago. Did you? I knew that they were putting it together. You know, I was, I'm very blessed again. I've gotten to work with Kobe a bunch with, you know, at the Mamba Academy up in Thousand Oaks. We did some work for him. And um, he's, and actually, in, you know, what's funny is that in the footage of The Last Dance, there was Jordan passing Kobe going into the locker room. Mm-hmm. I was literally right there. Because I was with the, um, I was literally standing in that spot, like in that hallway as they were passing, and I got Kobe Bryant to do a, um, to do a cameo for a movie that I was making, and I, but we were we had the contract with the Bullets, so we were up at Madison Square Garden for that All Star game, and Kobe, n- nobody really wanted to talk to Kobe. He was like, he was just kind of a novelty. It was like, oh, he's the kid. Um, so we got him to do a little thing, and at that same night for this movie that I did. I got Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield, and Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> really? I did. I got Kobe Bryant, Evander Holyfield, and Mike Tyson, like bang, bang, and Donald Trump. Well, it's pretty hilarious. Since you brought it up, you heard they're going to fight for charity. Uh, well, not Trump. That'd be awesome if he was in there. Uh, Holyfield and Holyfield Tyson. Holyfield and Tyson. Yeah, that's not a good idea. Mm-mm. That's, are you, that's are, not but, a good idea. But will you watch it? Because I know I will. <laughs> No, I will not watch it. I don't, I don't listen. There, there's no good. The only, the only way that there could be something good is if the WWE steps in and they make it super entertaining. Other than that, it's like, it's just going to be a train wreck. It's two guys way past their prime. I don't want to see either one of them get hurt. You know, it's like, like, let just let it be. So you're <laughs> saying if without Don King, Mike Tyson is the guy who punches people. Without Don King, what? Without Don King, Mike Tyson is just a guy who punches people. And no one gives a shit. Uh, 
No, no. I'm just trying to get you to call out. I'm trying to get you to call out Mike Tyson on air so I can record this and send it to him. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm not gonna call. I'm not gonna call Tyson. You know what? We like I said, I got I had the chance to work with him a couple times, and what was interesting is how he was. He it was very interesting with Mike Tyson. Like he was constant. Like remember how big of a star he was. Yeah. Songs are being written about him. <laughs> He's the most feared guy on the planet, and. What was interesting is that the way that he dealt with the media, he felt he felt like very objectified. And people that were like worried about Mike Tyson suing the media, suing something. He I was around him when when uh, somebody was talking about, hey, we need a release to use footage for something. He's like, I've never sued anybody for any reason ever. Like you guys are the ones that sue people. Like I'm, I just do my thing. And it was, it was a really interesting, authentic moment where he's like, you know, I'm not the one, you know, going around suing people. I'm the one being sued. So I'm not, you know, I, it's, it becomes crazy. Would you watch a reality show where we paid Mike Tyson, we, we paid for his uh, travel and everything to go to the homes of people who said like nasty shit about him on the internet. And he just shows up at their front door. Would you watch that? <laughs> yes. I don't think, you know, th if you watch the Tyson documentary, like his mm. biopic, basically, yeah. I, I believe, you know, biopics, obviously, you got to take them with a huge grain of salt because it's, you know, obviously you're writing your own story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you take it with a grain of salt. But I, I will, I believe Mike Tyson when he said he never liked boxing. I believe him. I, he's like, it was my way out. And once he started going, once he lost to Holyfield, I, I'm sorry, no, once he lost to uh, Buster Douglas, he never won again. Mm. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, I, like, I, I agree he's with like, you. like, I didn't like it. I, I agree with you. I think it was his way out, and it was one of those things that he was just great at or made himself great at to get out. And then yeah. once he was out, he's out. Um but, you know, afterwards with uh, the taxes and, uh, you know, all the money he was losing, he almost forced to, to, be, to kind of become Mike Tyson again. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you remember he was training at, uh, was it Planet Hollywood? Um, and he used to yeah. go there and pay money to watch him, like, shadow box in the ring. Like, he did a bunch of wild shit. Um, and now he's doing... He did, uh, he did his one-man show. Yeah. He did a bunch of stuff. But, he, but you know, the, the idea of, like, think about, think about this. It's also, it, it goes for Tiger Woods and it goes for all the greats. Once you lose that mystique that, oh my God, you can be beat, you, you get beat. Like that, that was easily 50% of his game is scaring people. Yeah. So once it's no longer that scary and once you're like Buster Douglas beat you, oh, and Holyfield beat you twice. And like, you can't, like, you just don't intimidate people anymore. And that's, that's your downfall. Uh, do you think the Warriors would have been like that if if LeBron hadn't won that championship? I mean, look, they were get, they they were on they were looking good to win Game Five, and then all that bullshit went down, and blah blah blah, and then Draymond misses Game Six, and blah blah blah, and you know what what happened from there. But if they had won that second championship two times in a row, stuffed Cleveland back down. Um, there's two points. One, do you think they would have had carried an air of mystery? Because I don't think they did into that second season. Even though they won 73 games, I don't think that people thought they were unbeatable. I thought the other teams really – I think me as a fan, after seeing them come back from 15 down in the third quarter so many times, I thought they might be unbeatable. But I don't think the rest of the league did, the players at least. Like it hadn't had time to catch on. But if they had I, won that second one, I feel like maybe that would have become a thing. Like, oh, shit, here we go again. It's the fucking Lakers and Bulls all over again. You know what I mean? Or the Spurs or whomever. Yeah, I think that that championship more than most has the asterisks of, you know, that Draymond miss in game six was, mm -hmm. I mean, that ruined any result. That yeah. was like, okay, so if the Warriors lose, it's because they didn't have one of the most valuable players on the floor. Yeah. So it's not that fair. And as I recall, it was like over, it wasn't it like, like he just had one too many technical fouls or something. It was one too many, yeah. And basically, what happened was, I mean, everybody saw it. LeBron stepped over him, and from what I understand, called him bitch. And that's not something you do yeah. in the NBA. And he like swatted at him like this, and maybe caught him in the nuts a little bit, which is pretty funny because I would have done the same thing. Totally. Uh, yeah, totally. The, it was the other part uh, of that is it, every, that, everybody. That's like the. Go ahead. 
That's like that's that's like if the NBA had suspended Dennis Rodman oh, yeah. for going to Vegas. I know, right? It's you stupid. know, you'd be like, okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't get it. The other part of that is a lot of people say that if Golden State wouldn't have lost, they would not have gone to get Kevin Durant. But I don't think that's true. I don't, I don't think that's true at all. I think they absolutely had plans to go in the offseason and get Kevin Durant and upgrade their team, R regardless if they won or not. I think that was going to happen. It may have been harder yeah, I, to convince I, I, I KD. Agree with you. It may have been harder to convince KD, but th that was their plan for sure. And then now everybody is talking about, uh, I mean, it's, it's kind of slow roll through the grapevine, but the Warriors have a plan in place to get Giannis on their team. Like that's what they want. They Maybe. Want, they want it two years from now. Maybe. Well, let, let, let's restart this season and then kind of <laughs> go from there. I know, right? <laughs> yeah, we're about to figure it out. I, I will say this. New York opened up today, um, and they said, hey, guys, we're ready to have professional sports back. So that's a big one. I didn't think that they would this early, but uh, Cuomo came out this morning and said, I want to see Bill's football uh, specifically. So I, yeah. I, 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 mean, think, I think look, we'll have – At this point, at this point, you just got to – say look we're taking it you know we're taking a risk we're gonna we're all fine with it we're taking a risk with everything i've been i've been so vocal about this stuff from the beginning of when i i said day one the day when 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 we all look back on this it's gonna be the great misinformation campaign it's Agreed. gonna be like the great fear campaign turns out it the for the you know fatality rate isn't that high so we're there are a lot of people are gonna get sick unfortunately a bunch of people died Mostly elderly, most mostly people who had you know compromised immune system. But look, you open up, and if you're sick, stay home. If you you know are prone to getting sick, stay home. Otherwise, party on. Yeah, yeah, agreed, <laughs> agreed. Uh, Mr. Brinkus, we appreciate you being with us today, my man. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, always a pleasure, guys. You guys are the best. Um, I appreciate you, and and thank you for the compliments, and thank you for not. Um, you know, I didn't want to feel too self-conscious because I am devastatingly good looking right now. <laughs> it's like a young Macklemore if you're watching at home. <laughs> I'm thinking about calling Child Protective Services, to be honest. <laughs> I know. We'll see what it's, happens. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, there was a knock on my door. I got to go, guys. Yeah, right, take it. Take it. Uh, for All John right. Brankus, Danthony Danthony Holloway, I'm Ross Patterson. This is the Drinking Bro Sports Companion Show. Good night, everybody.